Hey everybody, so today uh, we've got a 922, a Daisy 922, and based on the uh, the lot no, it uh, appears to be a 1980s vintage. So uh, typical for these guns, it's missing the loading tray. Uh, these guns came with a single shot tray and a uh, five shot string tray. Uh, we're going to 3D print a single shot tray and put back in this gun. But again, being an 80s vintage, what I expect we're going to find when we take this gun apart is it's going to have a brass 22 caliber barrel. It'll probably be a clamp on since it's an 80s vintage. And uh, the rest of the valve body should be very uh, similar to... Uh, the current 80, 80s that we're used to, or should I say the brass tube vintage uh, 880s that we're used to seeing. So it'll probably have a brass tube, a uh, similar uh, valve setup to an 880. And being an 80s vintage, I don't, I'm pretty sure, about 99% sure this will not have the lawyer spring, as it's called. Uh, and disassembly and reassembly of this gun is extremely similar, almost identical to uh, the same vintage 880s with the brass tube. So I think one of the problems this gun's having, as you can see, once I start to uh, move the pump handle, it's going to spring out. Okay, that tells me it, the uh, it's pressurized, but it's not firing. You know, it's just a click, which tells me it's probably in total valve lock. So also in this video. If you ever experience this type of situation with a gun, uh, I'll show you how to cure that. Now, I, I was provided this gun to repair. I have no history of this gun or why it's in valve lock. I don't know how many times it was pumped or whatever before I received it, but it was sent to me to uh, see if I could make it work again. So I'm pretty sure that won't be a problem. Obviously, it's sealing up good. So... It's either a case where it was extremely over pumped and in, in valve lock, or it could be a problem with the fire control group. Something, maybe the spring is damaged and it doesn't have enough oomph to uh, extend the poppet or something to that matter. But we're gonna dive in and find out. This video will also show you how to disassemble and reassemble these weapons. It's, and uh, uh, this video will, can also serve as a guide for other Daisy guns, because even the current versions, the disassembly and assembly is extremely similar. Uh, there's just a little bit of difference between these vintage guns and the newer guns in the valve. But even the fire control group is almost identical. Other than, of course, uh, your newer guns will have the flat spring, or also uh, known as the lawyer spring, uh, in the fire control group. Which this gun, I'm sure, does not because it's older than that design. So without any further ado, we're gonna start taking this gun down and uh, start working on it. So one of the first things you wanna do or the first thing you wanna do is probably go ahead and remove the forearms. So just about all Daisy's forearms attach with two screws at the front of the forearms. Uh, and over the years it has changed uh, in several different uh, weapons as far as how the secondary attachment works. Some of the vintages will have a, a, a loop, molded in loop in the form, and there'll be a, a tang, if you will, on the frame of the gun that these uh, forms snap into before you uh, put the screw in. Others will have a hook on the form, and there'll be a hole or a slot in the barrel shroud that they hook into before you put the screw in. So one thing you don't want to do is when you take the screw out holding on the form is just try to, to wrench it off. You're going to end up breaking the molded in loop on the form, which most guns I've, I've seen or worked on, those loops get broken because they're pretty delicate. So when you remove the screw on the form, you want to gently pull it out because it's also usually a, a male and female uh uh, register at the front of the form you have to get the form out of that register without putting too much side pressure on the form so not to either break the hook or the loop and once you've cleared that register you want to slide the form forward don't pull outward to remove it and that'll more than likely prevent breaking the the hook or the loop whichever the vintage you have
So get, just remove that screw. I'm gonna gently pull it out, pull it forward. This one did have the loop in the form and you can see, like I said, just about every one of these I've ever worked on that, that this is where that loop is. And I don't know if the camera's picking that up well, but you can see it's been broke. Uh, that probably happened many years ago would be my guess since this gun's uh, approaching 45 years old. But I mean, it's a super credit to Daisy that these old guns have held up for half a century and are still viable today. And yet, this this side, the, the actual loop tab is completely gone. Who knows where that went? Again, it probably could have happened 20, 30, 40 years ago. But here's the, uh, the tab on the frame or the hook on the frame that I was referring to that that loop goes into. So... If you're ever replacing these forearms, it does matter uh, the vintage because some of them again will have the, the loop on the forearm, some of them will have a hook. And the ones that have a hook, there'll be a slot right in this area of the barrel shroud that that hook slides into. So if you're ever replacing these, you need to see if your frame has these uh, tabs for the loop. If they don't have the tabs for the loop, then the barrel should have a slot in it for the uh, forearm hook. All right, so moving right along, now that we've removed the forearms, uh, the next thing that I'll do is start to remove the receiver halves. So one thing you wanna do is make sure you cock the gun, and then I, I like to uh, slide the bolt slightly forward to where I can see the probe, but it's nowhere near engaging the breech. Now the reason you need to do that is because the cocking fin in the valve body needs to be down to allow the bolt uh, to slide off. Another thing, it, it doesn't really matter which uh, receiver half you remove the, the screws from first. I typically start with the non-bolt side, the left-hand side of the receiver, leave it in place while I rotate the gun over and then remove the screws from the, uh, the breech side or cocking side. Another great thing about daisies are most of the hardware, the screws, uh, have remained the same, same size over the years. Uh, while the newer guns have more screws and additional screws, uh, the screws that are in the same location as they've always been from basically almost 1970, whatever it was, three or five, uh, they're the same even today in, in the current guns. So now we've, we've got all the screws. We're just going to gently start to pry out on that receiver halves. And it just goes pop. <laughs> but you want to be gentle with that. Make sure you don't break your trigger guard. These things are kind of hard to come by. I've made a mold to reproduce these. Uh, because they're so rare to come by. Also, uh, this being a 922, it's got the funny looking bolt probe. It's kind of a, looks broke actually, if you're not familiar with it, but it's not. It's uh, just got a slight chamfer out right before the end of the probe. It looks like the probe's uh, just, again, one solid piece other than that chamfer. And then right at the end, uh, it's hollowed out and a little little less than half cut off. Uh, it's very interesting design. I guess it, that was designed to allow air, better airflow to the skirt of the pellet, but uh, I believe this is unique to the Daisy 922s. The 822s have more of the traditional probe uh, that has a little pin on the end versus this uh, hollowed out cut off probe design. And this being an older vintage, it has the more radius and rounded uh, bolt lever versus the more squared off levers of the newer designs. Just some useless, neat information. 
And yet, we have the brass clamped on barrel. Remove the stock. So now that we've removed the receivers, I was wrong about this gun not having the flat or lawyer spring. It actually does. So I uh, guess I was a little off on my vintage and when the lawyer spring was introduced. Uh, with that being said, since this is a repair gun, we will be putting that back in there since this is not mine. I don't get to make that call, but uh, those are never fun to put back in. It's not that it's super difficult. It's just uh, aggravating to get everything lined up more so than without it. But in any case, this will be a good video to show how we disassemble and reassemble the fire control route uh, as it came from the factory. Also in this video, uh, one thing that we'll get to cover that uh, is not the same on current guns is this uh, clamped on barrel. Uh, on most of the newer guns, I think it started around 1985, the barrels were pressed in versus using a clamp like this. Uh, so on the pressed in barrels, we have another video on how to remove pressed in barrels, how to reseal pressed in barrels. So we're not going to get into that. That's covered in another video. But this video will uh, at least show how to do the clamp-ons, which we don't have as of yet. So one thing I do not want to do at this point is remove the uh, pump arm, which would be my next disassembly step. But because this gun, I'm fairly certain, is pressurized I want to leave that pump arm up there in case something catastrophic happens and uh, the valve tries to shoot forward so uh, one question may be I'm going to press in the lawyer spring and fire and notice uh, there's no release of air uh, one question may be is in a valve lock situation how do we relieve that well Normally we would grab the washer on the poppet, the crimp washer, with a pair of needle nose pliers and we would have to pull it out manually and that would release the air in the chamber. But just now, uh, since I've got the receivers off and I can see what's going on with the gun, I'm going to press in the lawyer spring, pull the trigger, and I saw the poppet actually did move outward. So that raises an even bigger question as to why is there pressure on the uh, the piston? This is kind of a, a new one on me. So why is this uh, pump arm got so much pressure on it when it's in the fired position? And the poppet's obviously coming out. I can see it. And you see the spring back on this uh, piston. So... Uh, we're going to have to dig a little deeper to see what's going on with this guy. So now that I know there's no pressure in the pressure chamber, because I can see that the poppet did move outward, and it moved out sufficiently, that I know it uh, provided a gap between the transfer port and the poppet head, so there's no pressure with uh, in the combustion or pressure chamber, excuse me. Uh, so now we're going to be very careful and remove this uh, pump arm. And I'm going to hold pressure on it while trying to remove the pin. Okay, now I'm just going to close it and push forward on the pump mechanism. And that came out without any drama, so that's good. So this is our pump arm assembly. There will be two guides at the pivot point. We're just gonna remove those guides and set them aside. Then there'll be a pin that holds the piston assembly to the pump arm assembly. Just remove that pin. And we're gonna set this pump Assemble, or piston assembly down, so the pivot pin aside. And that's our pump arm. This is probably one of my favorite vintages of the aluminum or cast pump arms. And one thing uh, I should have pointed out before I disassembled the gun, but this receiver does not have the retention spring that normally is uh, installed right ahead of the safety button. 
and there's no uh, there's no mating points for it because it never came with it. So how these pump arms are retained is there's a plunger right at the back of the pump handle. I don't know if that's showing up real well in the video, but that plunger actually uh, interfaces with the trigger guard. There's a cutout here in the trigger guard where that plunger engages and it's chamfered so that when you pull down it pushes back in to the pump handle releasing the pump handle the interesting thing is uh when daisy transitioned from this plunger to a, a knob or a button if you will on the back of the cast pump handles they still left this cutout in the trigger guard that I can only assume was originally designed in for this plunger. So an interesting fact is you can use these vintage pump arms with the plunger on the newer, if you will, vintage guns. As a matter of fact, you can use them on the, the brand new current designs because even the, on the current designs with the molded in trigger guard, they still left that cut out there that again, I can only assume was originally there for these plungers. So these are really cool pump arms to swap out or install on later guns and you can get rid of that, uh, that funny retention spring that uh, installs into the receiver halves, which that thing can be aggravating during assembly in, in any case. And lots of times people just remove them so that it's quiet or pumping. Next we remove the barrel shroud Another thing you'll notice on these 922 barrel shrouds, that it's got an inner uh, shroud, if you will. And most of all the daisies do, but uh, on the 922s, it extends the length of the shroud and it's it makes a really sturdy, and this is a, a really stout, heavy barrel shroud compared to the newer shrouds. So another thing, if you've got find, come across an old uh, 922 and it's just, uh, it's beyond saving. It's probably still worth uh, picking up for the for the parts. Like swapping out this heavier barrel shroud. It's going to have less deflection. It's going to add a little bit of accuracy maybe to your gun. So picking up a 922 for parts is a great idea. Uh, even if it's just for the pump handle and the barrel shroud, those are two uh, upgrades I like to make on other guns. Another thing you can do is take the brass barrel from a 922 and install it on a newer gun and make it into a 22. Now I've done that to a 1977 to convert it to 22 caliber and that gun built 25 foot pounds of energy. It's a beast. So uh, I said that I converted uh, the 1977 to 22 caliber using a brass barrel out of a 922. If memory serves, that gun had a pressed end barrel and I'm not exactly sure uh, what vintage or what years they went from a clamp on to a pressed end. I think it was May of 1985 when they transitioned from clamp on to pressed end barrels. So if you can find a 922 parts donor uh, post May 1985, it should have the pressed end barrel that would be a direct replacement into uh, the newer guns. Now these clamped on barrel guns will have a hole on the bottom side of the barrel as well as a slot milled into the barrel. And that is because the uh, barrel picks up the air through the transfer port through that hole instead of the hole being in the breech itself. And the slot that's milled into the barrel lines up with a, a male receiver on the uh, valve body for alignment purposes in, in both uh, the horizontal direction so and rotational. So that way it helps register the hole in the barrel to the transfer port. But the question I've got, and uh, maybe one day I'll get to try that out, is can a clamped on barrel be installed in a newer receiver and used? In other words, can this 22 brass barrel clamped on barrel be put into say a 1977 current gun and work. I don't, my, I suspect it can because the hole uh, in the 
uh, clamped on barrel should be well within the contained in the breech of the newer valve bodies and therefore sealed up. So I think uh, these older clamped on barrels can also be used in the newer style valve bodies to make a more powerful and larger caliber weapon. But I uh, have not tested that, so I'm not going to say for sure that's a, a possibility, but uh, it's something to consider and maybe worth trying out and one day maybe I'll get to do that. But I've got one other 922 that I personally own that's a clamped on like, and it's basically the same vintage as this gun, but it's in working order. It's pretty weak. It's very weak compared to the newer guns, but uh, I just do not want to uh, scrap a, a good working order vintage 922 to uh, make another Frankenstein. But if one day I find one that the valve body is completely trash in, uh, I will try that. So somebody installed a little piece of tape over this barrel and uh, frame. Not sure exactly what the purpose of that was. Probably not a great idea because that just held it up against the frame and it needs to float in the front sight. All right, so now that we've uh, disassembled the gun to this point, the next thing we're going to do is there's a little screw right here on the barrel clamp that we're going to remove. All right, once that screw is removed, there's a tab on the back side of the barrel clamp. We're just going to rotate the barrel clamp and slide that tab out of the valve body. And there's our barrel clamp. Then the barrel will simply lift out. And I don't know if that'll pick up well in the video, but there's a milled slot in the barrel and a hole in the barrel. And again, the hole is to receive air from the transfer port on the valve body and the slot lines up with the register here on the valve body and there's a seal that goes between the valve body and the barrel. And this is, uh, looking at this, this is a newer seal and it does contain an O-ring. The factory seals did not contain an O-ring. This tells me it's probably from our friend Ron over at Gateway to Air Guns, Ron 06. He makes some fantastic replacement parts for these vintage guns to include that valve body to barrel seal. So if you have one of these vintage guns and you want to do a reseal on it, definitely contact Ron over at Gateway to Air Guns. He can hook you up with much better parts than even uh, were available from the factory when new. And certainly much better than repl most replacements that you'll find. So now that we've got the pump mechanism out, we've got the barrel off, we've got the stocks and everything off, I'm going to re remove the valve body retaining pin. I'm simply going to hold down on the frame of the valve body, remove that pin, and I just heard it release with a little bit of spring pressure, which is somewhat normal, but uh, it also sounded like a little gasp of air, so that's odd. Now I'm gently going to pull the frame halves at the back of the gun apart to allow the valve block to slide out. And here's our valve body. So it's in the cock position. I'm going to go ahead and release that and inspect the poppet to transfer port. Everything appears normal. I can see the poppet is off the transfer port. Cocked, I can see the poppet engage the transfer port. Hmm. I think I see the culprit here. 
So I don't know. So the fire control group is moving the poppet off of the transfer port. In the cock position, there is a gap between the hammer and the poppet stem. So the poppet is fully seating. I can also visually see that. The one odd thing, and maybe uh, my recollection is incorrect, I know on the newer guns, the hammer forks in the cock position uh, basically come all the way back to the poppet seat or the poppet uh, itself and make contact with it. Here there's a serious gap between the hammer and the mating surface of the poppet which makes me wonder if this uh, hammer is not bent but uh, it's been a while since I've taken one of these older screw-in poppet guns down, so I'm not sure if I remember that correctly. So we'll, we're going to go ahead and disassemble the fire control group and compare that hammer to a new one to see if it may be broke or bent. But in any case, that, even if it is, that's still not the problem with this gun because uh, it was still lifting the poppet off the transfer port which should have released air. And the gun seemed to be sealing. We could hear no air escaping when we were pumping the gun. But we got no release of air when we fired the gun. So right now we're uh, not exactly sure what's going on. I was told this gun was recently resealed or rebuilt. And from what I'm seeing that I believe that to be the case. Everything's pretty clean. This piston assembly, the elastomer looks almost brand new. Being a 45 year old gun, if, if it hadn't been rebuilt, this thing would be mush and leaving black crap everywhere. And the O-ring feels new. It's still nice and elastic. It's not dry, cracked, and seems to be no cuts or cracks in it anywhere. So, so far so good on that. Now we're going to pull the compression tube. And there's our clear frame. Oh yeah, this is a, this is a, for sure, one of Ron's reseal kits. If I can tell that by this machined aluminum ring. Now we gotta remove the spring. And last but not least, we're going to gently push the seal out. Sometimes these little guys can be a little stubborn. You just wanna gently push that out. And the seal is appears to be new as well. So that wasn't a problem. The tube appears to be in good shape. There's no scratches or mars on the tube. There does look like there's a little bit of crud in this retaining pressed in ring. So I'm going to go get some Q-tips and whatnot and try to really clean around. So when repairing these vintage guns, you need to really make sure that that uh, inside radius where this ring is pressed into this uh, valve body or this compression tube, that up against that ring on the inside is very clean and on both ends. And the reason for that is... Uh, your seal mates up against that ID of that pressed in ring. So if there's uh, trash in there, dirt, chunks of anything, it can prevent 
sealing uh, with the seal side. Also on, on the inside, if there's uh, any kind of trash or dirt or debris up against that ID, it's gonna interfere with the piston compression height and sealing as well. So you really wanna, when you rebuild these guns, pay particular attention to that pressed in ring when you're cleaning your cylinder. Even if the straight wall portion of the cylinder is mirror finished, looks fantastic, that ring, pressed in ring is the most critical part of, in making sure that uh, everything's, the job's 100% done. You've got to, got to really do that. That one doesn't look terrible, but I can definitely see a good bit of debris. Could be pieces of the old seal, you know, when, when the gun was rebuilt. Could be chunks and pieces of the old elastomer uh, that get down in there and they really get stuck because that stuff is terrible uh, which is why I like to replace the elastomer with the spring out of a 1977 so you don't end up with that kind of crud in your compression tube so with that being said it's uh, nothing seems to be super obvious as to why this gun's not functioning properly uh, it was a great reseal kit. It was obviously sealing, but I'm not sure why we're not uh, we're not getting good pressure or firing. So uh, the next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and thoroughly clean the compression tube. I'm going to disassemble the fire control group out of the valve body. We're going to uh, inspect the spring. Make sure that uh, we've got adequate spring pressure and it's not damaged in any way. And we're going to, I'm really curious to compare this hammer with a new hammer to see if uh, maybe it's bent. Although none of those things seem to be the problem. Also, we'll pull the poppet and inspect it. But if it was any of those things, you, I should hear air escaping when I'm pumping or uh, I, I would expect not to see the poppet pull off of the transfer port if it was a valve lock situation but none of those seem to be the case so uh, we're just gonna have to dig in deeper and see what we All find. Right. So now we're ready to disassemble the fire control group from the valve body. We've got our punch and our little brass hammer here. Uh, and the only thing to do on on this, the first thing, is identify which side of the pin has uh, the knurling. In other words, on the trigger pin, one end of the pin will have a little knurl on it. And that's to keep the pin from sliding all the way through the valve body. Uh, and generally, when you're holding the valve body in the traditional firing direction it's going to be uh the right side of the valve body pin or the trigger pin will have the one with the knurling so you want to push the pin out from the left side that's not to say the gun wasn't reassembled and somebody flipped it because that is a common thing so you want to watch for that because what happens is if the fire control group is uh, disassembled and reassembled enough times, that knurling can uh, wallow out the pinhole on the correct side. So what a lot of times people will do is flip the pin around and install it from the other side so that the knurling actually will bite into the valve body again. Because once you start to wallow out that hole where the uh, knurled side traditionally goes, the pin will end up floating and through multiple cockings and firings it can actually start to come out and the reason it can come out you would think it'd be trapped once it was installed into the frame but for whatever reason daisy put holes or cutouts in the frame that line up with the trigger and hammer pin uh i kind of wish they didn't do that then the frame would retain the pins in the valve body but i guess they did it so that you could work on the fire control group while it was installed in the frame although i always find that more cumbersome and difficult to do because the frame kind of gets in the way when you're, when you're trying to do that work so uh yeah i don't know why they did that but in any case it appears that this fire control group does have the pin knurled on the correct side so we're going to 
flip it over on its left hand side and we're going to tap that pin out now this is under spring pressure so once you start to tap that out that trigger is going to try to come out so be aware of that and generally when you tap that in you want to go ahead and let the the punch slide into the pin hole to help hold that trigger in place till you're ready to relieve that spring pressure and you don't want to do it directly over the table because then you're just pushing the pin into the table so I usually just slide it so the edge is just off the table and that spring pressure caused it to kick out before I could get the punch in well that happens just use your thumb to align that pin back to the hole to where you can push that all the way through like that and now the punch is holding the trigger in and the pins out and you, I'm sure you won't be able to see that on the video but uh, some of these pins the, the designs change somewhat over the years this pin it's just got two stamped in uh, swedge marks on it instead of actual knurling I've seen them actually knurled and then I've seen them where they had the two swedge marks this one the older pin has a swedge mark and that's important when you go to re assemble a fire control group you don't want to put your trigger pin in the hammer hole because the hammer pin is actually smooth all the way through there's no knurling on it but one trick is if you start to have issues with your hammer pin like even this gun you can kind of see it I don't know if it's showing up well in the video but the, the pin is protruding that means it's moved in one trick uh, you can do is put a trigger pin in your hammer pin hole and uh, when you tap that in, that knurl will help hold the hammer pin from floating. So now that we've got the trigger pin out, I'm going to hold pressure down on my thumb on the trigger and then slide that punch out. Now that I've done that, I can, under control, release that trigger. Now that's hooked on to the uh, hammer now, so sometimes you got to press in on that flat spring and rotate the trigger to get it to release so if it doesn't want to release push in that flat spring and rotate the trigger and it'll come out so you can see our hammer spring sitting on the spring pad on the trigger the trigger looks appears to be in good shape And the spring appears to be in good shape, but it seems just a bit weak compared to a newer 880 spring in any case. So we may swap that out. Then you just simply push your hammer pin out. It's not knurled. You don't even need a tap. You just can take the punch and push it out. Then your hammer will release. That's interesting. This hammer's got a good bit of flashing from the casting process on it. More than normal, but that shouldn't necessarily hurt anything. And the last thing is slide that flat or lawyer spring out. Now we've got almost a totally disassembled valve body. The only thing left is to remove the uh, the poppet assembly so this being a vintage gun it's got a screw in poppet the newer guns have a, a rotated in uh, interference fit poppet so I'm gonna go get my wrench and be back oh, all right now we've got our wrench We're ready to take our poppet assembly out I'm just gonna unscrew it Nothing appears to be an issue there. Transfer port looks good. Everything looks good. Uh, one thing to note on these screw-in poppets, if you ever go to replace one of these on the 
old 880s or 922s uh, or any other vintage of the older guns, you'll notice if you on this poppet, uh, it's more of a chamfer, an angle to the tip versus a radius or rounded. You'll see advertised uh, screw-in poppets that are claimed to be a direct replacement in these vintage guns. And if they have the rounded versus chamfered uh, poppet tip, they will not work. I don't care if they say they will. They say they do. Uh, myself and several other people that I know about, probably many more, have purchased those as advertised direct replacements and they will not seal. They will not seal at all. And as a matter of fact, the stem is too long and uh, the hammer won't even engage the crimp uh, uh, washer to relieve or the pressure in the, in the chamber. So if you ever get one of those, it's not going to work. Uh, Ron has been working on uh, fixing those so they will work with the uh, older vintage guns. So if you are in need of a poppet from one of these vintage guns, I would highly recommend contacting again Ron over at Gateway to Air Guns and he can probably help you out with that. Uh, the good thing is these Man, these last forever. I've, I've not really experienced uh, a poppet failure. Uh, I've caused a couple to fail trying to uh, do different things like relieve the spring pressure in the poppet and what ha have you, but I've never uh, seen one that just uh, w was broke or wouldn't work. Uh, so that being said, if you do have to replace one of these guys, It'd be great if you could source an actual takeout from another vintage gun. Uh, but the radius ones that are advertised as replacements for these guns don't work. So if you go down that route, uh, you'll find the same thing that we did. But inspecting this uh, poppet, everything looks good. Even the O-ring seems to be good. I'm not sure when this gun was resealed if this was replaced or not. It looks like it might have a little memory. In other words, be a little bit squished. So we're going to go ahead and replace that O-ring since we've got it out. Although again, I don't think that was a problem. So now we have a completely disassembled bare valve body. We've basically completely disassembled the gun minus taking the piston assembly apart, which there's absolutely no need to do. This piston assembly has obviously been recently rebuilt. The elastomer looks perfectly new. Uh, the O-ring looks and feels perfectly new. This is obviously one of Ron's new reseal kits. Everything about it looks fantastic. One thing to note on Ron's reseal kits is the original seal was a one-piece seal. Ron machines these uh, seal washers or seal pistons to accept the new style seals. Uh, the reason that's so fantastic is uh, those old original one piece seals are hard to come by and they want to live in fortune for them. Whereas the new seals are uber cheap and you can still get them from Daisy. And Ron's kit is generally much less expensive than just the one piece vintage seals. So I would highly recommend contacting Ron and getting an updated seal kit if you're going to rebuild one of these older guns.